Hello, everyone. Welcome to Rubber Industry Leadership Program. Rubber Industry Leadership Program is a Technobiz initiative. The object of this program is understanding the leadership and management practices of rubber industry by having conversation with leading rubber industry leaders. Through this program, we will be able to learn about these leaders' experiences, both good and bad, the challenges, best practices, the vision, and also the future plans. You may call this program as a mini MBA on rubber industry management, but this program is aimed for younger professionals to learn from the real and inspiring journey of rubber industry leaders. In this episode today, we are hosting a well-respected and well-known rubber industry leader, Mr. Rajendra Gandhi. He is the managing director of GRP Limited based in India, a globally recognized company which manufactures reclaimed rubber, industrial polymers, custom dye forms, and rubber composites. Please allow me to show you a short video on uh, GRP before we get into today's discussion with uh, Mr. Rajendra Gandhi.
concern. Now, I'm very pleased to invite uh, Mr. Rajendra Gandhi to join us to have a conversation in our rubber industry leadership program. Mr. Rajendra Gandhi, please. Welcome, sir. Good morning, Param. Good morning, Param. Good morning, sir. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and uh, for this uh, rubber industry leadership program today. I'm really um, honored to have you in this, uh, you know, in, in this uh, program today. Pleasure is mine also, Param. Yeah. So. Sir, before we, I will have a conversation. I just want to make some ground rules for you. Okay, uh, this is not a serious uh, program. This is going to be a coffee table conversation. Um, but um, I may touch on various aspects of your whole professional journey and also your values, your beliefs, you know, for the benefit of the uh, current generation and also the the next generation. So I hope is already with you. Okay, that's fine. I will do my best. Sure. Sir, let's get the dive into the, our conversation. First, I'd like to, you know, get into the how this, how is your entry into the rubber industry? Okay. So it all started in um, 1973. Uh, I had completed my graduation from IIT Mumbai an Engineering Institution. I had joined the family business. And in one moment of quiet reflection, one morning, I had this clear thought that instead of remaining in the legacy of the family business, which was textiles, why I should step out of it and do something on my own, um, uh, which I can be proud of. So that thought kept on uh, bugging me, lingering. And around that time, I came across an article which uh, spoke about how for a developing country like India, recycling had a great future. And there were three or four uh, reasons the article uh, mentioned. One was that uh, we did not require at that time any license uh, for raw material because we were a controlled economy at that time. So for raw material, because the raw material is all waste material, uh, it generates employment uh, potential. Uh, third was that it would um, uh, be uh, augment the virgin resources of the country for a developing country like India that was very important at that point of time. And fourth was that it can be a foreign exchange earner or a foreign exchange saver depending upon whether it's import substitution or whether there is an exports uh, earnings coming out of the export. So these uh, thoughts uh, inspired me to look at something to do with the recycling and uh, after exploring various uh, options including um, metals uh, gold silver because i was a metallurgical engineering engineer um, uh, but then i zeroed in on rubber recycling and um, it was a chance meeting with uh, mr kim philip who was considered the father of the indian rubber industry at that time and um, he also encouraged me to look at rubber recycling uh, as, a, uh, as a new opportunity for me. So that's how I got into uh, reclaim rubber. So you started in 1974, right? Yeah, so the company was promoted exactly on the 29th of June, 1974. Okay. You know, that, that was the year I born. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you got a long journey, yeah? Long so journey. We have, yeah. we have birth of two great entities. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about myself, but I see that Gene, you know, um, uh, GRP is uh, became the one of the leaders in the recycling, for the rubber recycling. You you made a kind of. Um, uh, uh, what you call it a, a trend setter you know particularly in india and as a global player and so it's really very inspiring how was at the time you know in the beginnings can you talk about how was you know when you start a business what kind of i don't think it's going to be smooth anyway okay so what was it like at the time but now you got so much technology so much resources the accessibility is different at that time how was uh, your 
uh, experience at the time in the beginning of your 1970s or maybe you know, late 80s so i think uh, as far as india is concerned it was a um, it was a, in a state of controlled economy where we were considered to be a socialist country at that time and there was a lot of influence of socialism and uh, free enterprise was not as freely encouraged at that part of time because of various geopolitical reasons um, uh, and in those kind of setting to start a new industry was always challenging uh, but for me uh, the purpose was to i never thought that i will uh, sort of grow big but i wanted to start something small but something where i can say that it was my creation so this idea of starting this and uh, when i start when i formed the company uh, i also was a believer in values because i believe that each one has should have an individual as an individual certain values so for me one of the values i cherished was that i didn't want to do anything to cut corners so whether it was in terms of uh, giving bribes or uh, doing something which was uh, shortcut in the short run but it can be harmful in the long run mm -hmm. so when i first realized that the machines that were required for the reclaimed rubber were not made in the country and they were to be imported and if i had to import i needed a license at that point of time and if i had to have a license um, unless uh, i sort of offer some easy money it won't be possible so uh, and that was against my values so it was a thought that uh, sort of prompted me to look at can i build these machines in india itself instead of depending on imports and uh, luckily my colleague uh, very senior uh, and well known rubber technologist at that time mr wg desai he had some experience in uh, building such uh, equipment at that point of time so i uh, sort of decided to follow that path of designing and building the machines uh, ourselves uh, and of course mr philip also endorsed that thought and we proceeded with designing of the equipments and then building the uh, plant uh, the required machineries uh, based on indigenous uh, vendor development and resources so what we now say in terms of atman nirbhar and made in india i think uh, those concept were not but probably i i pioneered that in a way yeah, yeah. but it's it it will be i believe that it was a really hard task at the time you know to get it done here yeah, and getting everything yeah. when, I, when i went uh, with this proposal to my family they were not willing to give all the money to me they felt that you know i have no experience in this idea of building the machines whether they will work or not work they were also concerned so instead of giving me whatever the money i required they gave me a lot less so it was for that balance money i decided that i will uh, make my company a public listed company mm -hmm. so Uh, and I felt that that thereby will be accountable to a larger shareholders and not just my family member. Uh, so for a, a meager sum of 15 lakhs, I made a public issue of my company. And wow. uh, and when I decided to do that in 75, um, uh, the stock market was pretty good, and we had some good connections in the. stock market so some of the brokers said that we will underwrite your shares and uh, because they knew our family and i thought that it would be a cake walk to get the money through the public issue but it was around that time that um, uh, the government of the day declared emergency and the stock market crashed and mm -hmm. all the stock brokers decided to withdraw from uh, their underwriting commitment so the journey began of getting institutions to underwrite my shares and um, uh, i went about meeting each uh, financial institution and uh, requesting them to uh, underwrite my shares and it took me two years uh, to get this 15 lakhs sum um, underwritten by at least seven six or seven different financial institutions 
the likes of ICICI, Unit Trust of India, the Bank of Baroda, and various other such uh, institutions. Once they handed out my shares, then I went through my public issue, raised the money, rest of the money that was required. And uh, that's how I raised all the capital required to uh, start the plant. Uh, we started the production somewhere in 1978 uh, through all those uh, hardship. And uh, it took me, it took us three years to remove all the bottleneck or teething troubles in our equipment. So those were the challenging times and it was a uh, one step at a time in faith and uh, in the belief that uh, this is the right way of doing things. Uh, after but we learned as a result of it we learned a lot because of the self-fabricated machines uh, what works in our machines what does not work so we gain very valuable experience from that uh, uh, exercise and by 81 so in 1981 yes i think that we we turned the corner and we started making the profits and thereafter we have not never looked back so you know, in the in you are the first one in the rubber in rubber segment as a listed company, or anybody else in the before. In the reclaimed rubber, yes, we were the first and uh, probably yet the only one, or maybe there may be one or two. I don't know, recall, but we were the uh, one first. But started right from the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and uh, if you have your felt, oh man, it's too much to take, or uh, you kind of. You, you push yourself to, you know, with all these difficulties. How, how at any time you felt discouraged about all these um, you know, issues? So it was, you know, when I look back, I feel that, uh, you know, those having those values helped me to build the company uh, on, a, on a right foundations. So uh, I think it's a choice and entrepreneur. Or a leader has to make uh, whether he wants to lead his organization or lead his life based on some values or based on some other factors. So that's the kind of a choice I made. You were you were graduate of IIT Mumbai. You did in metallurgy. Now I can call it now not in the metal anymore, but more into the polymers. Okay. Um, uh, how was the education at the time? In, you know, in the, in the IIT Mumbai. Is, is it a, promoting entrepreneurship or, you know, you know, usually, you know, IITs, you get a campus interviews and by the time of fourth year, you are getting your jobs out, you know, so <laughs> I well paid jobs. That's how the VC, you know, I'm a chemical engineer from you know, in government university. IIT was, okay. uh, you know, that when I was finished, I finished my plus two and I, you know, we applied for the IIT exam. It was a challenge to get into it. And I always look at the people IIT. Wow, it's a great achievement getting into IIT. Okay, and uh, uh, by the fourth year, people are talking about getting a you know campus interview jobs and things like that. So, what was education at the time? You know, uh, they're focusing on entrepreneurship as well as at the time. No, so I think uh, IIT were known at that time to uh, produce the sort of first class engineers. So that the whole focus was on engineering uh, and different disciplines of engineering and I was fortunate to get into uh, IIT uh, to the entrance exam but I did not get the line I was aspiring to. I wanted to do chemical engineering but uh, my ranking was not good enough for me to get uh, uh, and I, I didn't want to go away from Mumbai because earlier school days I had spent almost six seven years in a hostel during my school time also. So I thought that I would like to rather like to stay in Mumbai. So uh, I had to choose between metallurgical engineering and civil engineering. And I've decided to choose metallurgical engineering at that time. But I think the stint in uh, IIT, later on I realized that they prepare you to more to uh, look at problem solving techniques. So while you study metallurgical engineering, but uh, you learn a lot in terms of how to systematically go about solving a problem. 
and that I felt was my learning in IIT and that really helped me uh, when I started GRP. So for me, it was not the knowledge of metallurgical engineering, but it was how to go about systematically solving an issue. So that was, that came in good state for me. And are you still an active alumnus of the IIT Mumbai and active involved? To some extent, yes. So we have we just completed. We are celebrating the 50th year of passing away, golden jubilee of passing away from IIT. Congratulations! Yeah. 71, 71. So, uh, so I'm connected in some of the projects in IIT as a result of this. And how do you see the current education system at IIT? It's changed dramatically. I would say dramatically. Now there is a lot of emphasis on management on um, uh, liberal subjects, etc., uh, to provide more of a holistic uh, education. Uh, and I think that's a change taking place, I believe. Uh, I feel that uh, probably IIT is also looking at it, uh, that instead of only producing engineers and managers, it's time for them to produce leaders. Yeah. So, so that is an emphasis more on the kind of skills required from that angle. So I think. I think now it's all about uh, startups, entrepreneurs, and uh, leaders. A kind of uh, the picture has changed. I know we have so many engineers now already. So yeah. we need to. And I, uh, we need to them. I, I just realized that when we were there, we were in our campus, 1,600 students in Mumbai campus. Uh, today, I was I, I was sort of astonished to find out there are more than 13,000 students in the same campus, and uh, out of those 13,000, more than almost 2,000, 500 to 3,000 are girls, and and the emphasis is not so much on undergraduate but more on postgraduate and research. So that's also a major shift in the sort of strategy of IIT. So at the time, you know, you mentioned that IIT, you know, you got a lower rank that you choose uh, between, uh, you know, metallurgy and the civil engineering, you finally, you know, choose the metallurgy. At the time, what was uh, the, uh, you know, the branch that people take and if you, if you get a good rank? Is it computer science at the time? No, no, computer science came much later. So okay. uh, mechanical and chemical were the most sought after at that point. And we had in IIT a new, a branch which was just opened up that was aeronautical engineering. Okay. So a few people also decided to opt for aeronautical engineering. So. See, when I was when I was a student, you know, and then we, we always we get a good rank. You people choose the computer science first. My age time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, think I, I, yeah. yeah. So, I think in the late break. in the late seventies or eighties, uh, the computer science began to grow. We had electrical engineering. Uh, I think that then we moved on to electronics and then the computer science and all the chips and other things and on the software and hardware. In the early 90s, mine I finished in 94, and then you know it's, at the time it's uh, computer science is is the popular or electronics. Uh, you have EC electronics and communication engineering. That's you know, at the time. Yeah. Okay. Let's get into the, our uh, GRP, sir. Can you talk about uh, you start with the recline? And you move into the you know you kind of diversified into other verticals as well can you talk about the evolution of the grp yeah. so as i mentioned that because we decided to build our own equipment and uh, uh, produce a reclaim from that we constantly looked at what kinds of equipment could be required going forwards because the tire technology was also changing and it was getting more and more sophisticated and complicated. So we needed to always be ahead of the curve. And uh, so our, our desire to upgrade our equipment and all those continued and the technology was changing. So in the mid uh, 90s, um, we were looking at what else can we do instead of just uh, pulverizing the end of life tires and producing the reclaim or rubber out of it. And we realized that the end of life tires still had a lot of retained mechanical properties because some of the tires are still very tough and because it's a highly engineered product. 
and it has still had a lot of other properties. So uh, as, as, as a time when we met some American companies and uh, they had some understanding of uh, how to make certain components out of the end of life tires and uh, they were looking at the right partners uh, uh, where these such types of nylon tires are available. So we partnered with them and we developed the equipment and the processes to, to sort of cut and uh, punch parts out of the end of life tires. So that's what we call the customs die forms. Yeah. So customized die forms and those customized die forms, the parts that are punched out are then used uh, by certain American companies to assemble and make certain finished applications out of it. So uh, that was the uh, beginning of uh, uh, sort of diversification from reclaimed rubber to the, as we call it, CDF, the custom die forms. And that uh, that started, and we began to uh, expand that. Uh, we also began to look at different kinds of reclaimed rubbers from our same set of equipments. So uh, we didn't uh, restrict ourselves to produce reclaimed rubber only out of the end of life tires. But we, because we knew our products, our machines, and what can work and what cannot work, and we were sort of looking at the processes and other things. So we started producing reclaimed rubber out of the tubes, inner tubes, then from the liner materials of the uh, automobiles, from the examination latex gloves. Uh, that experience we had when we were at a joint venture partnership in Malaysia, where we exported our machines and uh, we set up the joint venture in Malaysia. And that's time the Malaysian government was struggling with the sort of examination latex gloves, waste material, finding its way into the uh, natural rubber uh, bales and being exported. So they were concerned about their reputation. So they asked us to look at, can we do something with this waste uh, latex gloves? So that's where, again, we used our equipments to produce reclaim out of the examination latex gloves also. And mm -hmm. so that experience to diversify into such other different kinds of uh, uh, reclaim. So today we have the widest range of reclaimed rubber in the world, I would say, uh, apart from the, the tires, the different parts of the tires, then we use the this butyl reclaim, whole tire reclaim, natural rubber reclaim, PDM reclaim, uh, nitrile, so all these different kinds of reclaim rubber we produce as a uh, whole range of reclaims we give. Then we moved on to this uh, uh, CDF. Then we realized that tire has a lot of nylon in India. And um, so we wanted to, so we worked on developing that technology and the process of extracting that nylon out of the tires and then converting that into engineering polymers compounding material and uh, that is now uh, established and there are, uh, that's another vertical we have added and uh, we also then work with an, another American company to see whether we can uh, blend the, the the ground rubber and the other ground polymers with the uh, other polymers plastics other things and we are able to develop some products which can will have properties of thermoplastics. So yeah. where we uh, sort of mix the uh, blend of the rubber properties and the uh, plastic properties to produce a thermoplastic material of that nature. Mm -hmm. So that is another area which we have also what is known as a composite for polymer composites or the rubber composites. That's another area we have moved into. So uh, these are the sort of three or four different verticals uh, we have started and. Uh, each one is growing. So there's still the reclaim is the major uh, revenue maker for the GRP. Yeah? yeah, because it is out of the out of the byproducts of the reclaim. So nylon comes right. out of the scrap right. tire, round rubber comes out of the scrap tire. Mm -hmm. So all this is then blended together and then converted into different products. And I, I, I realized that uh, since the beginning itself that you emphasize on R&D, you know, you, all these, you know, diversification, you cannot do just like that. 
uh, you know, you need to work on the, uh, so can you talk about your R&D, you know, investments and all the vision and the time? So, you know, as I mentioned earlier that the very idea that or based on the values that we should have importing the machines, we started uh, building the machine, designing the machine. So that kind of uh, culture uh, we sort of introduce in the company that anything that we do new should we uh, do it on our own strength and not dependent on the on outsiders uh, so that culture sort of helped us to spend part of our revenues every year in development and r d and uh, we thought that there was a natural process of growing and learning so we continued with that so even uh, we had developed our own process of how to deal with our affluence uh, mm -hmm. because of 90s um, you know uh, the pollution control was not that uh, sort of uh, strong or uh, so strict and and we realized that we have to do something also as responsible corporate citizens that while we are converting a waste into a useful raw material but in the process we should not be generating other kinds of pollutants so keeping that in mind we began to see how we can recover and uh, do the primary treatment of the uh, uh, water effluents that were part of the process. And uh, we found a way to recover the oil out of the water effluents. And uh, we started recycling that oil back into the reclaimed part. So uh, that would also take away the odor and the other uh, toxic materials from the waste stream, etc. So those kinds of work we continue to do uh, silently but uh, we feel uh, it was uh, not that we uh, uh, had to do it, but we wanted to do it. Yeah. And it's all your values and believe in the values that you believe in. So, and uh, how, you know, if you look back in the last 45 plus years, um, what was the biggest challenge that you experienced that, oh, it's a really like a huge, Mountain is uh, heavy, you know, in terms of challenge for the GRP. So the first was, as I said, the starting on the basis that we wanted to design our own equipment, and it was a journey in faith because I was new, I had no experience in this, but it was in the belief, and I had to trust my senior colleagues that they will uh, deliver. So, so I realized that. Uh, if we have to do something, we have to learn to trust. Trust in our own um, ideas uh, and be prepared to take the risk based on the ideas that you and the values that you are willing to work on. So that is the biggest challenge. And I think which meant that when we began to do well, we began to establish ourselves, we have to become trustworthy. So for our customers, for our suppliers, so it was it was that thing that on ongoing basis that how as a company our culture should be such that we remain trustworthy, uh, and that enable us to gain a lot of uh, sound relationship with customers. Uh, today, if we are uh, a food vendor and preferred a food vendor for the seven out of the ten top global tire companies it's because of that trustworthiness that we have developed and that deep relationship with our customers uh, look after what their real needs are so that's that's been an ongoing challenge and it, it is uh, continuing to grow. so how is the overall market now for the reclaim market globally how do you see the market going on? We have seen is it has gone through uh, certain waves of um, highs and the lows, and it has a lot to do with the natural rubber uh, prices and availability. So there was a time period between, I think, 2006 to 2012, when natural rubber was in short supply, and uh, China and other countries were growing so rapidly that the natural rubber prices had shot up to i think probably about 200 or 220 rupees in indian rupees and there was a huge demand for reclaimed rubber and 
many people felt that time that reclaimed rubber would have a great um, uh, future at that point of time, purely because of the supply demand scenario. Uh, and uh, so as a result of it, we also grew very rapidly during that period uh, in the reclaimed capacity. But as a, it also meant that because we were a public listed company, uh, many people began to copy. So they also set up reclaim. So we invited competition for ourselves during that period. <laughs> So I think by the time uh, 2012, after the Lehman Brothers crisis and lots of other things, I think the markets began to uh, sort of mellow down on the global market and the natural prices also began to uh, go downward. So from 2012 till probably almost to the COVID period, uh, there was a slow, uh, very slow, Growth, a sluggish growth in the rubber industry and in the tire industry also. So that for the and because by the time so many competitors had come up, so there was a price pressure on the raw material side as well as on the finished product side. Uh, but I think we continue to remain uh, buoyant and we continue to remain uh, preferred supplier for most of our customers. But of course, the margins were under squeeze. Yeah. I think mean, now we have so many, you know, so many players in the reclaim market, particularly from India. So, yeah. And I, I think now the kind of tire, tire companies also everybody is focusing on the circular economy. You know, they, they have everybody got their own vision now. And uh, so, did you see the the growth in because of this one also in terms of the increasing the reclaim? I, I, I feel that again, this would be where the industry and the community and the world has to take, make an informed choice. Because if, if the circular economy needs to be given a fillip, uh, everybody should play their part. Uh, and everybody should look at this as a responsible response to our resource, global resources and the uh, raw materials and everything, energy, carbon footprint, everything has to be looked at yep. into tariff. Yep. So uh, I, I'm glad that uh, tire companies are quite aware of this and at least the global tire companies and, uh, and also the Indian car companies and I think this EPR, extended producers responsibility, which is sooner sort of the government is going to come up with a legislation on that and once the policy is announced by the government i think it will become mandatory for the uh, rubber industry and the tire industry to look at uh, recycled rubber in different forms to be used to uh, deal with the waste tires on one side and for the with the resources on the other side I think you also launched this ESG, right? You know, ESG profile uh, and on the ESG world as well. From a sustainable point of view for the GRP. Yeah. Um, so that is the, you know, the uh, done by the United Nations. The sustainable yeah. goals have been announced by the uh, United Nations, and I believe there are some 17 or 18 different goals for the sustainable growth of the uh, economy, world economy. And uh, they are encouraging corporates to look at uh, where they can connect with some of this. So we have also looked at it from our uh, perspective. And uh, we are looking at environment as one of the important uh, uh, goals, social goals that we want to pursue. Also poverty alleviation because of the employment generation that we would like to provide uh, to as many people. So some of this, the goals we are pursuing as part of our corporate philosophy also. Okay, uh, we we'll like get into a little bit onto the um, your partnership with the Marangoni, that is a, a, one of the milestones, right? The retreading, typically the truck uh, tires retreading. Can you talk about that partnerships and uh, the vision behind it? And also, I saw that you guys are doing the franchise systems as well. Um, so where currently, how it is and what are the future plans about it? 
So, you know, Marangoni had been our customer. So we mm -hmm. have a relationship with them as a customer for over 20 years, I believe. And uh, it was out of that relationship, uh, side kind of friendship developed with the family and, and uh, we proposed to them at some point of time that, you know, their technology is unique and that uh, their technology can be introduced in uh, India. And uh, that, uh, and for us, it meant that if we go in, in if we go into this uh, kind of uh, activity, it will help us to strengthen our supply chain because we will be able to then uh, source uh, end of life tires which cannot be retradable. So instead of depending on the aggregators, whether we could, our strategy was that it will help us if we were having those franchises who are going to put up the retrading shops then each of the franchisee can become the source for us to uh, collect the end of life tires which cannot be retraded and therefore we can uh, get as, that as our uh, raw material. So I think Marangoni were very uh, receptive at that point of time and we, we formed a joint venture with a view to introduce their technology and also to get uh, uh, Chazi's established network. It was a fortunately a slow process initially because, as I mentioned earlier, the 2015 onwards the economy was not sluggish, growth was sluggish, dry industry per se was not doing that well. And in India, the retrading industry is well entrenched, but uh, you know, the likes of LG and MRF they had their own franchise network and. Uh, for them, for the normal uh, retrading uh, uh, retraders to look at this new technology meant a new investment. So we decided to set up a, one uh, unit to demonstrate how the Marangoni technology is quite different and unique from the various other technologies that were available. And uh, we began to penetrate in different parts of the country by establishing uh, franchises to do the retrading, etc., uh, and um, uh, we also helped Barangone to design and build some of the equipments in India because of our knowledge about vendor development in India, so that they can uh, get their some of the basic equipments done at a much lower cost uh, for the Indian franchisees. So that uh, was something which we helped Amaram wanted to contribute. Uh, but we had to rely on the, the trade retreats that were built by them because of their technology in uh, uh, Europe or other parts. So we had to import on that. And one of the challenges we faced here for our franchisee was that because of the foreign exchange fluctuations, uh, yeah. The, uh, not, uh, we were not able to offer the uh, retrades at a consistent price and uh, there was always a constant pressure of uh, uh, doing that uh, with the, um, the, the franchisee. And uh, so we suggested to Marangoni that why don't you think of setting up their uh, actual trade over manufacturing also in India. Now that was their highly um, uh, protected and uh, uh, you know sort of uh, technology which they were they were for obvious reason not ready to part that technology with a partner and we realized that, that for the future of uh, the retrading business if this technology comes it will benefit the retrading industry in general in India yeah. so we we have just uh, concluded a friendly exit from the Marangoni partnership. So we have now no longer the 50% uh, partners with Marangoni, but we have helped them to establish their technology. And I believe some already eight or 10 franchises are working in different parts of the India. In India. And uh, uh, so that's a good starting point for them to uh, expand their business from here on. Okay. That's but it's a huge market is there for them, you know, the, the trading is growing market everywhere. 
So I think uh, as a part of the circular economy, the government would also like to uh, give support to the retrading because that's one way to reduce and or reuse the materials. Basically. Right. right. So uh, a, little, a little back to the you know listing the comp listing the company in a stock exchange, the Bombay Stock Exchange. Um, uh, it's always nice to be a listed company, um, but it's, it also comes with the pains as well, right? You know, you have response for the number of shareholders, their expectations, you have, you know, shareholder meetings, and I, I've been involved, I mean, a participant of, you know, the meetings. I, it's not as, it, as easy as it looks, okay? Of course, it's nice to list as a listed company. Um, can you talk about, uh, you know, as a listed company, what kind of your experience, you know, or, or do you encourage others in the rubber industry to be listed as well? So I think first and the foremost is that you, if you are a family owned company and if you want to uh, become a listed company, uh, you need to be clear that you are, you will be accountable to larger shareholders and various government compliances. If you think that you are going to uh, do things on your own without bothering about this, if you follow that kind of a value system, then you take another uh, sort of direction. But, and we know that today so many corporate uh, leaders or have, because they have used this or misused this to public money for their own personal gains. Um, they have sort of uh, not been successful or they have been run into a lot of troubles. So because we were clear right from the beginning that although we are a family owned company and because I wanted to raise balance of the capital from the public issue, I was clear that I would be accountable to the larger shareholders and to the government. And luckily, in, in people like Mr. K. M. Philip, who was the chairman of my company for almost three decades, uh, I learned a lot from him that how to be run a company professionally. Although we are a family-owned company, so uh, so which meant that we have to make company run professionally and not as a proprietary company. Um, this is a choice which family-owned businesses will have to make going forward if they want to grow. And if they want to grow, they will have to learn to run the company professionally. Okay. Um, just a little go back to other issues about the time management, which is, a, I think, one of the big problems for most of the managers and leaders. You know, and when when I, we have a conversation um, first time that you know you mentioned on this day we make, you know you will make a call you're on spot on time which I really this is what I really enjoy you know usually like a European style uh, uh, in Indians we all people have there is a there is a tagline you know Indian time means plus 30 minutes or plus 20 minutes you know that is what's been like you have a seven plants. You're, you're based in Mumbai. How do you manage your time to visit these plants and how do you talk overall your time management practices? So uh, honestly, um, uh, of the, of, for the last uh, few years as a part of a smooth succession uh, from one generation to the next generation, I am uh, sort of deliberately not looking into the uh, daily routine activities of the company. And I'm allowing uh, Harsh, who is now the joint managing director, to uh, take uh, decisions on, on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm now more involved in the uh, review meetings on a weekly basis uh, with all the heads of the department, what we call it as the top management committee, TMC. Uh, but in the, during the time when I was active, uh, you know, I have a practice of uh, having a time of quiet in the morning to reflect on what are my priorities and what should be my priorities. And uh, so I will be more guided by my inner uh, 
conscious as to decide what is the right thing and what is the right time to do whatever I am meant to do. Uh, not only on a daily basis, but on a weekly or monthly basis. So that practice has helped me to uh, maybe develop uh, better time management practices. Also, I think I realized that if I have to run the company professionally, uh, it's, I need to trust my colleagues, my subordinates, I have to develop them. I need to make them, uh, empower them to take decisions. So it's not necessary that everywhere I have to be there to take a decision. And uh, so I have to rely on, and if you have the right management information systems, today it's possible to digitally uh, you know, connect uh, with all the plants. So we, we had invested, we were one of the first to invest heavily on, on the ERP systems of uh, you know, uh, computers and uh, all those things. So, we have introduced SAP, which has helped us to connect all our plants uh, uh, through the digitally. And uh, we had the practice of video conferencing with the plant managers long before COVID came in. So, okay. uh, so all that has helped us to, you know, see and also build a team which will feel more responsible and accountable for the business. Goals, kind of you delegating and professionally manage. So, so manager takes care themselves. You know, you don't need to involve into the very yeah. minute issues as well. And so, yeah. in fact, we we have a budget exercise which is bottom up. We don't decide the budget. It starts from the shop floor and moves up to say that what should be the targeted budget for the year ahead or uh, the annual operation plan. We provide the top management provides some guidelines, but then all the detailing is done by the various wow. managers and heads, and they then come up and and their own uh, the KRPs as they are called, key results area KRS are based on the budgets that they have themselves taken the ownership of. Uh, it also brings us some kind of sense uh, sense of ownership and sense of belonging. You know, it's uh, that's a very good practice. But do you visit your plants uh, quite often uh, when you were active? So I was, when I was actually, yes, probably every plant at least once in a month. I used to visit. Mm -hmm. uh, if required. In fact, initially when I was struggling with the first plant at Ankleshwar, I decided to shift with my family and I stayed there for two years, more than two years when my kids were very young. So I got them admitted in the local schools uh, because that was my priority that I needed to see that all the machine that we had worked and established, uh, they work well and if there are any teething troubles, how to get rid of those teething troubles. So that was the uh, thing. So I, I sort of had lots of shop floor experience actually because of that. That's good, very nice. You know, you have seven plans and why don't you expand in one place, you know, or what is the purpose of having several different locations instead of, you know, a few locations, but with expanded capacity? What what are the criteria at the time you decided to put in the plants? You know, because when you when you put a plant, in a, again, it's like kind of starting over, you know, a lot of, lot of work to do, a lot of civil works, you know, hiring and you know, a lot of kind of things are there. So can you can you give your input on, you know, the, so as I said, when we built our first plant in, in Ankleshwar, uh, you know, our first plant in, with the first line, it was 200 tons per month capacity plant. And uh, uh, once it got established you know, and started functioning well in 1981, by 1981, we decided to put up the second line. And because we were building our own machines and uh, doing it, so we sort of decided to plow back the profits of our company to keep expanding and not to depend on a new capital. So we did it. And so when we completed the uh, ex first expansion in uh, Kaleshwar, we realized that the you know, scrap tires is a bulky item and uh, it will be futile to bring tires from long distance to uh, one uh, location. And uh, also we realized that time that 
the labor market was a little uh, tough and uh, you know there could be labor problems uh, and just to insulate ourselves from both these factors we decided to then set up the next plant in Sholapur in Maharashtra mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, we felt that that could give us the um, you know wider area for where we can uh, cover the raw materials and also we will be able to cater to the tire companies which are also in the south so if we had only one plant in one in Gujarat then if your tire company was our major customers uh, you know we had to make sure that they get the raw material uh, their raw material or our finished product in time and uh, uh, at a lower cost transportation cost so these two were the driving factors for us to go to different geographic locations but then the other plants are within the vicinity of these two nuclear plants so if in Ankleshwar we had plants so we also then uh, have um, another plant just 20 kilometers from Ankleshwar uh, and another third plant is another 25 kilometers from Ankleshwar so three plants in Gujarat are all sort of in the same uh, vicinity so other infrastructure uh, cost will be less because of that but uh, we had to do it because we were getting into these different product lines different verticals yeah. so different verticals needed different kind of a work culture different kind of uh, processes for monitoring etc so mm -hmm. we had to have a different location for that also same thing in uh, Maharashtra we have three different locations but around Sholapur only so that's how the six locations are and one location is in Madhya Pradesh uh, in Indore again for raw material. We had a plant in Tamil Nadu for some time, but uh, we found that it was not possible to manage that plant because of the uh, you know we didn't have enough approvals from the tire companies uh, for uh, they are now giving plant specific approvals and uh, because of the COVID and various other issues we took a decision that we should close down that plant yeah. later on. Well, you already brought issues about the COVID. So people, you know, I think that was once in a lifetime experience for every human being and uh, you know, company or businesses, entrepreneurs. So what was your um, experience journey during the COVID in terms, did you get vaccinated? How many, do how many shots now? Four or <laughs> three? Or three. And uh, so, how was you know, how you did you handle? I think uh, there was a lot of issues about the migrating workers at the time in the COVID times in India. And so, can you share your uh, experience think, about the in different states and in different locations? We had to deal with different local situations because yeah. uh, the workforce was a combination of migrant workers as well as the local uh, workforce which came from in and around the vicinity of the plant uh, but our primary focus was first was protecting the lives and the second was to protect the livelihoods so we, we made that too as our focus that uh, so we uh, was we were allowed to operate the plants we began to see that the uh, workers who came were well protected understood all the protocols that were required to be followed whether it was distance maintaining a distance between two individuals coming with clean uh, clean dinners washing hands all the sanitary sanitization everything so we put in practice all those things and uh, we decided to make sure that uh, uh, there is no sort of loss of life uh, while they are at work basically so we made arrangements in different locations depending upon the situation where we made arrangement for them to stay overnight in the factory we provided them with beds we provided them with food and everything so that they didn't have to take the trouble of going back and forth their homes and in the process they might get Mm -hmm. uh, so got, got the COVID virus. So we did all that possible everywhere possible. We gave choices to the workers if they didn't want to stay overnight in the work uh, for and they wanted to stay in their homes. 
we permitted them for a certain period but once the government opened them that they should be allowed to travel we also made arrangements for their uh, travel commuting in the bus so that you know they come in the uh, their own bubble so that they don't need to be uh, exposed to others also so that kind of thing we wanted to do from the point of protecting the lives of the people and then when it came to livelihood wherever because of the uh, you know, situation where the migrant workers uh, were having also for them we decided to provide them with ration and for, for various other things because we felt that we need to take care of them and it meant that we had to bleed but thought we could afford to bleed but you know they needed their livelihood needs to be protected to the extent we can then we of course we uh, did a lot of other things like uh, we went beyond our areas of workplaces and, uh, we imported the the oxygen uh, those machines to give it to various local community hospitals when they were falling short of that Uh, as part of our contribution towards the protecting the lives of people in at large and then of course we got the when the vaccination was available uh, to our staff we sort of we asked them to wait in the government queues we paid for their vaccination costs and uh, got them vaccinated earlier so that they can at least be protected yeah it's was a A difficult times for everyone, the owners of the business as well as these uh, workers. So we are talking about workers. You know, how is the wages of workers in India? And um, it's just keep. I guess it's a keep on increasing. Okay. And so, how do you? Um, what is the situation now? She's she now with the. So two things have happened in my opinion. Uh, there is this government's policy announcement. a few years ago where niagara or something where the uh, workers who migrant workers will get ensured jobs in their villages they don't need to migrate provided they will get certain minimum number of days salaries now that began to catch up from probably around 16, 2016 onwards uh, and we began to see the shortage of migrant workers because of uh, that and Uh, as a result of it the cost of living of the people began to increase in the industrial centers and uh, so the uh, the da index was so our cost began to rise very rapidly and in the covid because most of the migrants went back we find that still many of them have not returned because they have got used to now staying in their own native place and they are earning something and they didn't want to take a risk of again migrating back to the city so that's one problem we are facing and also industrial activities have picked up since covid so as a result of it there is a uh, high rate of attrition amongst the workers as well as amongst the staff also so we have to deal with that challenges and we have to we are also now looking at uh, instead of we are making labor power processes labor intensive which was was our earlier practice with the intention that we will provide employment to people now we are sort of changing the strategy that we need to automate a lot of processes so that we can avoid attrition and we can control our costs also. so that's the process we are going through now so so its automation is also one of the solution to deal with this uh, labor issues and uh, so i think we have talked about you know we'd like to have some drink before we continue to have more discussion have some drink first <laughs> well, let me, that's my only drink i take <laughs> well that is universal medicine eh? i drink more water is always good <laughs> yeah that's good that's good yeah so you know it's a, it's a coffee with we have a very famous program here coffee with current so i'm enjoying this program of coffee with pen uh, uh <laughs> drinking my own coffee a little bit <laughs> oh please <laughs> yeah it's nice you know you you have you have mentioned lot of useful issues we we'll go and jump into more other issues your your external roles um 
you know, outside the GRP. Uh, you've been actually involved with the AIRA, you know, All India Rubber Industries Association. Uh, I think it has transformed to a lot, you know, over the years. Uh, really made and becoming an important uh, body for the Indian rubber industry. Can you talk about your experience, achievements during your period active time there at AIRA? So, All India Rubber Industry Association, when I joined, in the late 70s uh, because mr philip was active and since he was my chairman i also was encouraged to look at this industry forum to see what's happening and uh, i began to attend and luckily i was but able to participate in their managing committee and uh, looking at uh, issues with the industry or facing at that time the tire industry and the non tire industry were all worked together and uh, atma was not formed at that time um, uh, but uh, in my initial years in the industry i then began to understand that the tire industry has a different kinds of problems with the government with the planters with the uh, other issues whereas a non tire industry had different kinds of problems so i think the tire industry decided to uh, DYAIRIA and they formed their own organization which is now called Atma Automotive Tire Manufacturers Association. So we, they can sort of represent their problems uh, more uh, and at that time there was a conflict of interest between the tire lobby and the non-tire lobby so which was understandable so therefore I think that and we as Brickley River Manufacturer we were actually the raw material suppliers. Right. So, we were more as an associate members of the association and rather than a manufacturer members. We, we didn't qualify to become the ordinary members, only a rubber goods manufacturer. Right. But as an associated member, I think uh, they began to understand the importance of reclaimed rubber because of the high prices of natural rubber. The, the natural rubber lobby, plantation lobby was very strong. They were able to get their uh, say from the government and get their way done. And uh, so we had to come in as the third source of rubber hydrocarbon after the natural and the synthetic rubber. So we, we used that forum to pitch for ourselves uh, for the reclaimed rubber. Also understood the dynamics of uh, what ails the growth of the non tire industry. Most of them are family owned and most of them prefer to stay in, in under that SSI cloud because there was so much of benefit but the, the negative was that you know they never grew so so today if we look at the spread of the rubber industry it's dominated by those small scale industries which are languishing in a way they have not been able to grow beyond although India has a Tremendous potential in terms of the manpower, technical manpower, in terms of resources. And we can become the global player. We can now that China is slowly exiting from the rubber goods manufacturing. India has tremendous potential. And I think now uh, the that is now turning tide in our favor. Many non-tire industries of large capacities are coming up. Uh, to fill the gap and uh, becoming more export oriented. So my experience has been to see that the leadership on AI area, industry leadership uh, grows and strength becomes uh, really authentic. Uh, yeah, I have been instrumental right from the beginning when the rubber expo began. So Daniel Sampat and others uh, have been guiding them as to, and they have done a tremendous good job and that has brought India on the world map uh, with the kind of exhibition that has taken place so now. As a result of it, AIRI is also on a lot of good name and reputation in government as well uh, in the uh, global scenario. Uh, I also realize that uh, those who have served the rubber industry, uh, we need to uh, reward them and recognize their contribution to the growth of the rubber industry. So I was introduced instrumental in introducing the KM Philip gold medal 
to the individuals who uh, contributed for the growth of the Indian rubber industry. And I worked out that entire scheme because Mr. K. Philip is known for his uh, service and to the rubber industry and uh, considered to be the father figure of the rubber industry. And when uh, we were all celebrating his 90th birthday, that time I mooted this idea to the managing committee that as a part of our honoring Mr. K. M. Philip, can we introduce this K. M. Philip gold medal and uh, K. M. Philip family? They agreed to sponsor the model, the medal, but the uh, selection process was left to a committee uh, within the AIRIA, and I sort of worked out all the details of how the um, uh, mod, uh, the medal has to be, or the, how to find the right candidate, and uh, we did. We decided to do this every alternate year, and uh, probably you would have heard I, I mentioned that Manubai Patel was the first yes. recipient of this yes. medal uh, for his contribution, and then we have had a number of people who have been the recipient of the KM Philip Gold Medal for their contribution. Uh, for, for the growth of the rubber industry. So that's how uh, we we are able to recognize the the individuals who have contributed. I mean, you mentioned a number of times about Mr. K.M. Philip. Like I also am familiar with his name, but never met him in person uh, for the benefit of the younger people to know about him more. I know he's a father figure for the Indian rubber industry. Can you talk about what kind of person he is, okay, what was, you know, so you are closely associated, you was a chairman for your, your for your company, you, you know, I kind of, looks like he groomed you in the right values, okay, with the, uh, in the right path for the GRP as well, uh, for his contribution to the Indian rubber industry. Can you give more insights about Mr. K.M. Philip? So, Mr. K.M. Philip uh, comes from the, uh, Papillai family of Kerala. And uh, have I lost you? I'm here, I'm here. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so Mr. Uh, uh, Philip family, they were that 10 brothers, nine or 10 brothers. And uh, the same family owns MRF. Uh, the same family owns the leading Kerala newspaper, Malayaram Manorama. And they were in several other uh, uh, industrial segments, etc. Uh, uh, very religious and uh, upright people. Uh, and Mr. K. M. Philip, amongst all the brothers, was the public face of um, MRF. And uh, and he well because he was based in Mumbai. All the other brothers were based in South. Um, uh, he was his family was looking after their other venture was called the Philip Tea and Coffee Distributing Company, which was basically involved in the coffee and tea plantation because they were in the plantation, they were also distributing their own brand, Philip Tea and Coffee. But he was also engaged with the government uh, very actively in promoting and representing the cause of the rubber industry. He was also instrumental in starting IRMRA, the Indian Rubber Manufacturers Research Association. He was the person, in fact, he also started AIRIA also. So he was the founder member or the founder figure of. So everybody looked up to him uh, for the problems of the industry. And he was well respected even in the plantation sector uh, as well as in the government sector. Uh, so all this uh, made him, uh, and he would always say what is right in the interest of the industry. So uh, that was the kind of values I learned from him. And uh, so it has been a, a great privilege for me to have known uh, the family. And also uh, I feel that um, by instituting that award in his name, in his honor, uh, we are still continuing to remember him and uh, honoring him for his work and to the industry also. You mentioned that uh, K.M. Philip is one of the founders for the IRM Maria. So you also become, you also, you work as a chairman for a couple of, one term for the uh, IRM Maria. So can you talk about uh, 
your experience there you know i think irmra is one of the prestigious research organization uh, for the indian rubber industry including the tires yeah, so so i think in the in the late 50s uh, mr philip and others uh, realized that the uh, rubber industry was growing in and around mumbai at that point of time and there was not adequate testing facilities for the small scale rubber industries uh, to, to get their product tested and raw material tested so it started with a very simple small concept that we should have our own testing facility the industry came together and they formed this research and manufacturing association to do the testing of raw materials finished product and uh, provide some technical services to the uh, rubber industry in and around mumbai pune all that area was growing um, unfortunately after about few years probably 10 20 years uh, the industry was not able to support the uh, the association and at some point of time association was facing financial uh, crisis and uh, uh, for its own existential uh, survival mr philip then went to the government of india and uh, convinced the government of india to step in and provide the grants and funding so that uh, this industry uh, this uh, research can continue and uh, so it was in the late 70s early 80s that uh, irmra was almost taken over by the government because they began to provide the grant and uh, provide the money for the growth and uh, you know the technology was changing so we needed more and more sophisticated instruments and other things technology for that and uh, all that required huge investment and uh, it was not possible to earn so much of money out of the investment and therefore the government decided to give the grant and so mr philip then continued to be the chairman of irmra after government took over almost for probably 20 years Uh, then when he reached his advanced age it was not possible for him to continue and that's where the government then decided to have in rotation different individuals to become the president of irmra and the director of the irmra was appointed by the government as per the uh, any other government distributions uh, body so that's the practice uh, that was being followed and uh, in 2015 uh, the government of india appointed me to uh, invited me to become the president i was the first uh, person from the non tire industry yes. to become the president of irmra earlier uh, after mr philip also represented tire industry mr omkar kanwar was there okay, dr yes. dr gopal singh ghania was there so all of them were from the tire industry so i had the privilege to become the president as a non representative of non tire and not only rubber goods i am not only a rubber goods manufacturer yes uh, i represent a very tiny sector of the rubber industry the reclaimed rubber <laughs> so a lot of research you promote a research on the recycling side of it at irm mari at the time you were tenured no so i think i my um, during my tenure my emphasis was that i sort of encourage the director and the uh, uh, the uh, the officers to go out and meet the rubber industry people the non tire industry and see how we can provide service to them so that they can become more technologically stronger if india has to emerge as a strong global player of rubber goods manufacturers we have to make sure that our qualities are good and reliable trust with our processes are right so i encourage uh, the team at uh, irmra to uh, sort of and i sort of yeah, ask the, to strengthen the team so that we can provide more value added services and also i took some initiative to see whether uh, we can go in other geographic regions so during my period uh, we set up a facility in south and also uh, something on the in the east also so both sort of gain momentum during my tenure but it's now of course taken uh, further by the subsequent presidents also i think they're doing well also in the sri city in uh, near chennai i think that's one place yeah, yeah. So, uh, i went and selected and in fact i did the brown breaking 
groundbreaking ceremony, setting up the center also there. So it's a good in a lot of development. I think very useful you know, having the center there and also in the eastern side, Calcutta side also. In I think it's in located in the uh, cluster, you know, in the estate area. Super. So you know you were you were you were with AIRA, you were with IRMRA, you also were involved with IRMA, Indian Rubber Reclaim Manufacturer Association. How this association formed and you know what is what is going on currently in this association so frankly this indian reclaimed rubber manufacturer association uh, was existing uh, when i started the, my company so there were few reclaimed rubber manufacturers so let me clarify i was not the first one in the country to make the reclaimed rubber I was the first one to make the reclaimed rubber based on the indigenously designed and fabricated machineries. All the other previous plants which were set up had imported machineries. And uh, so that was the only differentiation. So when I came into this uh, industry, already that association was there and they were more struggling in terms of, uh, you know, sort of not stepping into each other's shoes in terms of getting the raw materials or uh, dealing with the customers because that was a time when everybody wanted to see that their, their uh, specifications are approved by the uh, different customers. So it was with that in mind, the uh, the, the association was working. So I, 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 of course I joined, I began to also take interest in the participation or in the in the meeting i think we used to meet once in a year or so not more than that uh, but for various reasons that in the, that association never functioned uh, smoothly because uh, so many players sort of came and then uh, exited the business so this nobody had that kind of a survival um, uh, as grp so if I now look back, there would have been, um, you know, a few dozens who would have set up their reclaim plants and they would have closed their reclaim plant in the last mm -hmm. 40 years. So, uh, so as a result of it, that association never made much headway. Is the uh, reclaim got the standards under the BIS for each? Uh, are you kind? Are you in the pro are you in, in 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 terms of technical committee to develop the right standards for the various types of reclaims? Yeah, yeah. So we have um, so there is a one is the BI standards that uh, we are expected to follow, but also each tire company has their own standards. Oh. So we are also required to meet their uh, you know unique uh, requirements. And this is where we pioneer because we felt that if we had to work with our customers and we had to really on their trust we need to take care of their small small needs so mm -hmm. it could be even in simple thing as like packaging specifications so if they wanted a, uh, a unique specification packaging for their needs so like if somebody says i want 7.5 kilo packets and not a 50 kilo packet as a specification so we decided to meet those kinds of requirements small small I think that's where we earned that uh, uh, learned that we have to earn the trustworthiness, trust of the customer. So we need to do small, small things which will help the customers feel happy and satisfied. Mm -hmm. So we, of course, are engaged in the uh, not only in the BIS but also in the ISO committees. Our company has been representing to see that new specifications are developed and uh, worked out. Mm -hmm. In fact, I would say that uh, one other thing that I realized in the late 80s and early 90s and when we began to look for export market, that the, the young generation of rubber technologies in the, in the uh, advanced countries, in the tire companies, had not learned about reclaim rubber in their universities. Because by that time, reclaim rubber had vanished, uh, for manufacture was vanished from Europe and USA. And uh, so we had to do, uh, so we actually built up an entire formulatory, rubber formulatory on based on reclaimed rubber. And we taught the rubber technology of this time, 
that how reclaimed rubber is different from the recycled rubber or crumb rubber because they thought that recycled rubber is crumb rubber is a, is a is a low value filler but we had to say that reclaimed rubber is not a low value filler but it is a third source of rubber hydrocarbon after natural rubber and synthetic rubber you can use reclaimed rubber as a hydrocarbon source and uh, if you understand its properties so that education when we began to provide uh, through the various literatures and the uh, funding books and etc in those days of course the uh, pdf and uh, social was so we had to have physical books we had to produce and print and send out to all our customers and explain to them the benefit of reclaimed rubber so uh, that that's the kind of work which we did in those days you know, when you're talking about this uh, formulations, uh, probably you know whether it is an NR or SR synthetic rubber manufacturers, they always give you some guidelines. You know what is the percentage of you know so uh, dosage, uh, PHR, you know, and uh, I think G uh, GRP should come up with a handbook, okay, uh, and with formulations, okay, you know, guided formulation, you know, just by using their uh, reclaims uh, as a separate uh, booklet yeah. we do have it we do have it and uh, uh, we make it available to our customers uh, from time we keep updating this uh, handbook uh, and even different formulatory and uh, we suggest we give that based on suggestive percentage use of uh, reclaimed rubber how the properties change uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, from 0% reclaim to say 20%, 30% reclaim, how the properties change. So then they can choose what percentage they want to have. So that kind of a work. But now, of course, we are back into picture because everybody is now very familiar with what works with reclaim and what does not. And therefore, that educational piece is now almost yeah. over. In fact. Yeah. 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 See, you are... Um involved with even you are the raw material supplier but you are associated with both tire and non-tire industry in india and globally as well for indian rubber industry uh, what are the way forward you know and also to what kind of challenges you see and what kind of markets there's still indian rubber indian, indian rubber people not exploring yet so can you give some my you know, guideline on this See, if you want to look at India because of its population and because of its geographical spread, there is tremendous opportunities in terms of uh, the growth of the Indian rubber industry, not for India alone, but to become the global supplier. Um, uh, we have probably the highest number of rubber technologies in the world, in the country. Uh, and then we have enough people, manpower available uh, for uh, the manufacturing base. Uh, what is required is the entrepreneurship and that, that boldness of the entrepreneurship and um, willing to not look at India as a market alone, but look at global market and uh, create global capacities, not just Indian capacities. So the, the mindset of thinking small and uh, remaining small just to gain some tax benefit, uh, we need to get out of it and we need to. And I believe that, that the current younger generations, second generation of rubber technocrats uh, are all uh, educated, uh, learned people. Uh, and they they understand business much more better. So, uh, you know, they, the second generation needs to really think big and think boldly uh, and uh, think globally. Think global, but act lo local, as we say. Right, right. Uh, and then uh, then uh, India can really um, uh, leverage its real potential, which is also there's no reason why India. I think that India's GDP, export GDP of rubber is probably around 3% or so, much, uh, it's still single digits. Um, nothing stops us from becoming a global player where we can have a significant percent of the global GDP of uh, rubber goods. Uh, but it needs that, and both tire and uh, non-tire. 
I think example can be of tire industry, Indian tire industry, uh, the uh, all the big ones, whether it is um, MRF, JK, Apollo, they have all grown, homegrown technology and they have now become global players and uh, they are having a uh, global and they have also now begin to export uh, substantial volumes. Same thing has to happen with the non-tire industry. I know they also had to emphasize on the building the quality, you know, inter international level and uh, Chilega, you know, right. is the, yeah, so, yeah. I think it's the attitude of Chaltai attitude or uh, just to cut corners. That's what I said earlier. Yeah. Yes. When you have the mentality of cutting corners, you will not, uh, in the global market, you will not survive. You will have to, if you want to sustain yourself in the global market, you will need to to do the things right way. See, in, in my past conversation on the leadership program, uh, when I asked the, you know, all the leaders, they said, what is the biggest challenge is, you know, human emotions, right? The conflicts, which you can't predict. You know, machines, you can control it. So in your case, your experience, um, um, are there, you know, did, did you see any uh, conflicts among the different managers, you know, uh, the misunderstandings. So, how do you how do you resolve those kind of uh, issues? It's a good question, and I think uh, uh, so. When you when you want to build a team, you have to remember that we'll have to have people will have diverse kinds of skills, and uh, no one person can have all the skills that are required to run a company. Yeah. So you need different kinds of skills and different kinds of skills means different kinds of mindsets of people also. So one has to learn to accept the colleagues as they are. One has to learn to trust the colleagues and one has to learn to have a healthy communication um, with the colleagues. And that's how you build a team in my opinion. And, uh, and also at times you have to deal with your own emotions. I remember one experience that when I had given some instructions to a manager of mine in one of the plants as I was living abroad, I left that instruction with him. And when I returned, I found that he had not obeyed my instruction, but he did it completely contrary to what I had said. And I was furious and I thought that it was a case of insubordination and that I needed to sack that person. So after a few days, when I went to visit the plant and uh, I confronted him and when I found out the reason he gave me for his acting uh, sort of contrary to my instructions, my conscience told me that he was jolly well right. If he would have obeyed uh, my instruction blindly, the company would have suffered. And because I was not there to consult, those were the time when we didn't have the international lines and everything to communicate immediately. So he would be able to support much more. And I had to swallow my pride and I had to say sorry to him. Because, and because I said sorry to him, he told me that he had come prepared to resign if I would have said something else. Oh. The fact that I had said sorry to him, and made him feel comfortable and and that's where i realized that as owners as managers we also need to deal with our pride as much as we expect others to deal with theirs right. and it's most importantly listening to them i yes. think that is uh, i think that is also one factor it helps a lot before yes. you say something just listen first so, now I say, Param, that in today's world of information exploration, explosives, we have to listen to discern. Because under, under information, there is so much of misinformation being spread right. that if you don't listen to discern, you might get carried away. Yeah, that's true. Okay. You know, you you are you are part of this. Um, Shroff Rotary Institute of Chemical Technology. I think you're doing some rubber technology, promoting the education program on the rubber technology. Can you talk about what was your intention behind it or how it is going now? So as, we, as I said that we are 
as corporate citizens, we are uh, so we contribute uh, towards such initiatives in education. So we support education. And when we came to Ankaleshwar, uh, some of us got together and we had formed one associate, uh, NGO, which was called Ankaleshwar Industrial Development Society, where we took upon ourselves that while the government can provide all the infrastructure, but we need to provide infrastructure in education and healthcare so that uh, the managers who come from different parts of the country, there for the sake of the children, they get good quality education and their healthcare needs are taken care of uh, through a very good state of the art healthcare. So uh, with the help of various industry support, we set up a school uh, in Ankuleshwar, which is one of the topmost school and uh, sports complex. We also have set up a hospital, which has done some phenomenal job in this COVID relief uh, times uh, to provide healthcare to the community there. One of the latest thing is we have set up a cancer radiation center in their hospital. I have the good fortune of becoming the president of that uh, uh, that trust uh, at the moment. Uh, but a few years ago, uh, for the catering to the needs of the higher education, uh, the United Phosphorus Group, which is uh, having their industry in Ankaleshwar also, their family, with the help of Rotary Club, decided to set up a, a SRI City College of Technology for chemical technology, for environmental technology, and for rubber and plastic technology. So uh, the various these technological courses they introduce as a higher level education. Yeah. And our company felt that in order to uh, support this higher education, we should uh, support their department of rubber and plastic technology course, polymer technology course. So that course has been supported by our contribution, financial contribution. And uh, because of my love for education, I'm on the trust board of that uh, organization. And now that company, that organization is now called the UPL Sustainable University. So it's become a deemed university now. So over the last few years, it has uh, emerged now as a deemed university. So we are going to be working in the area of sustainability, uh, and including research, fundamental research on sustainability, sustainable raw materials, sustainable finished products, designing of sustainable uh, materials, all this. So that's the kind of a work we are going to do it going forward. So it's all in the similar values of you. It's very <laughs> yeah. same. Yeah, and, and super. So and do you guys uh, recruit uh, students or uh, graduates from that institute for your company, GRP groups? Yeah? Yes, we do, we do recruit on an ongoing basis. And then people gain experience in our company for two, three, and then they move on. Many of them have started their own small ventures. It's good to see them growing and uh, taking a, a better. And they're all coming from ordinary families and then uh, sort of getting a chance to are their own units that's a great great achievement yeah, i think mean, that's uh this is a good to see they take care of their being self-reliant and uh, also they provide employment to others that's yeah um you know we talk about sustainable materials and things uh, do you believe in climate change it's not a question of belief it is a reality <laughs> okay <laughs> now so you see this what's happening in uk now or in Europe, you know, and it's uh, uh, it's caused by the carbon dioxide, green, uh, greenhouse gases, and uh, what are we doing is sufficient or not? And being an Indian, India also produces huge amount of the carbon the carbon dioxide and things. So, uh, do you is it possible to be a zero carbon society? Is it uh, be is it is it practical, uh, pragmatic? You know? So, you know, I don't think uh, this is a very complex uh, question and it cannot be answered, in my opinion, uh, by one sweeping statement. Uh, there are so many factors to be taken into account. Um, there is the need for employment generation amongst the developing countries and uh, for them to invest in new technologies 
uh, which are carbon neutral or carbon positive is not going to be possible in the short run. Um, at the same time, in the developed countries uh, where the consumptions are so high, it's a consumable society, so a consumer oriented society. So they are responsible for all the demand that has created in the third world. The third world supplies all the goods to the, uh, the advanced countries who are just so much consuming so much more, more than the, what they really need to consume. So uh, they need to also change their practices if they want to see that. Uh, so, and also there's a need, one of the major uh, source of carbon footprint is the energy. And energy is coming from the fossil fuel um, is the main cause of, uh, major cause. And of course, there are so many other factors, but if you look at the major causes, the energy. And we need to find alternative energies and the need for energy is growing by leaps and bounds as the population is growing, as consumption is growing, as industrial production is growing. All this is putting pressure on more and more energy needs. And if that energy needs has to be met through alternate uh, sources, and I believe whether it is a solar or the wind, but uh, as now people are talking about hydrogen as possible uh, source of energy, and if there are major breakthroughs in this kind of areas, and if energy can become very cheap, and then we can continue the economic progress without too much of fiber I'm sorry, carbon footprint but in the long run i think it's not that it's also the waste generation today the, we are producing so much of waste that uh, if that waste is not allowed dealt with uh, the whole globe will become a dumping ground everywhere so the circular economy then comes into picture so uh, how do we so these are all sort of different angles one has to look at it and i think uh, uh, everybody, all the stakeholders has to come together to find a common purpose. I think it's more to do with the being responsible in our in our behaviors and practices. It's not just an organization. It has to be individual. Uh, that makes a difference. I think uh, otherwise, uh, no matter how many policies, how many protocols, how many agreements happen, but it's uh, down to the individuals. Uh, you know. Yeah, right. We're right. We're absolutely right. Okay, sir. So we talk about the policies, the government policies, but the Indian uh, government policies. You know, can you talk about uh, how, you know what kind of policies still need to be changed for the benefit of the Indian rubber industry? Uh, I think there are enough policies in place, good policies in place, uh, which can benefit the uh, Indian rubber industry. Uh, the question is of implementing and making those policies more effective. Uh, and that's where I personally feel there is a uh, need to focus on that. Uh, the other is that if the Circular economy requires to be uh, emphasized and I'm not talking only for the rubber industry. India today produces, in fact, I was in a conclave in IIT Mumbai, so as a Gemini where we were talking about the, uh, the advantage of the, uh, uh, what do you call the uh, uh, CSR funding for the technology development. And it was there I, uh, we realized that if uh, India today produces almost 70 million tons of all kinds of waste, and this is going to grow. And uh, if we don't find answers to this waste management, uh, we will soon become a, a dumping ground for so much of this. So, so this would mean that uh, you know all the stakeholders has to come up with. Uh, responsibility of minimizing the uh, waste generation and maximizing the circular economy. Now, this is where government has to play a proactive role, in my opinion. They will have to not only ensure that legislature-wise 
um, waste generation is controlled and those who are responsible for irresponsible waste generation they should be penalized and they should be punished uh, and uh, those who are making uh, positive contribution in the circular economy they need to be encouraged and incentivized now this is where the government can make some changes and uh, uh, contribute towards that that's that's the only thing i can say and um, you know, as you know this, but the rubber industry is, I think 95% is a family owned businesses. And the transition is a big challenge. Okay, okay. Harsh Gandhi is following your footsteps, I guess, right? Okay, but is your limited listed company. But uh, um, when, I, when I was talking to you, I met I met Harsh for probably two times, a very short time. Now I feel that the way he behaves, it's also same like you. Um, for the people in the family business or in the rubber industry, if they want them to transition to the next generation, you know, what kind of things that you suggest for them? So, you know, in my opinion, uh, the first generation, many of the first generation entrepreneurs in the rubber industry were technocrats. So uh, they were either technical people working in some companies and they decided to set up their own plants, etc. Um, and uh, they had this mentality of remaining small to take benefit of the SSI, um, uh, whatever concessions were given. I believe now the second generation is, in many cases, is more educated, more enterprising. Uh, in some cases, the, there are no such second generation who are interested in the same business. So they are, so the, the first generation continues to sluggishly survive but uh, don't know what to do about their business. But in either case, my feeling is for a sustainable growth of a family-owned business in India, professionalism is a must. Yes. And our approach professionalism also means an ethical way of doing things. Uh, and if family businesses learn to do the things the right way, ethical way, uh, they will have much greater chance of survivals, growth, sustainability, and also earn a reputation for themselves. So even if tomorrow they want to exit from the business, they will get a better price for their uh, enterprise if they have done their uh, homework well and uh, done everything properly. Yeah, that's very important. Managing the company, even if it's a family business, managing it professionally makes a difference. Even you can pass on to somebody else, you know, that the company stays on. So, so outside the rubber industry, GRP, what are your personal hobbies, sir? How do you spend your time? And what do you, do you have any, um, you know, activities other than rubber? So I am connected with several uh, social organizations, uh, particularly in the field of education. As I mentioned to you, this trust that we run in Ankaleshwar, where we run a hospital, a school, um, we have a similar uh, educational institution in my father's native place in Bhavnagar, where we uh, provide uh, affordable education to 4,000 girls. It's only the girls' uh, institution. and there is from KG to PG, as we say, from kindergarten to post-graduation. Wow, so, okay. All for the girls. Uh, similar, uh, uh, there's an institution in Mumbai um, uh, where we have 8,000 students studying uh, in different streams of education. So, so there has been, so I spent time in different such social organizations, uh, being connected with them in different capacities. Uh, I'm also uh, sort of, of late, for, in fact, for many years, I've been reading my own scriptures and uh, of late doing some English translation of my scriptures. So it's a, it's a little work away from the social or it's to do with uh, gaining a little insight into my scripture and using my knowledge of English to see how we can convert it into English. Well, it's nice that you you emphasize a lot. You know, KG to PG is a great project. You that's uh, it's interesting. Yeah, very interesting. 
So okay, we're almost coming to the end of the you know, conversation. And uh, before I let you go, uh, I would like to touch two more points. Uh, one is that uh, what is, a, I know, I think you reduce your uh, role at the GRP and pass on the role to the, you know, Harsh Gandhi as a joint medical director, but uh, I'm sure that you, you are part of the, all the future plans of the GRP. So what else is in the plate? Um, you know, what, how do you see the GRP in the next 10 years time? So we are uh, sort of at the board level and uh, at the top management leadership level. I think that those discussion is more focused about what this should be our identity going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, is, should our identity remain in the reclaimed rubber as a reclaimed rubber manufacturer? Or now that we are ventured into these other verticals, uh, should that identity be there? Or there is a common identity which views all these activities and the future activities together. And therefore, we feel that you want to come out as a sustainable company, a company which is offering sustainable solutions. So in the sphere of sustainability, wherever there's an opportunity um, where we can contribute uh, and see that as a commercial opportunity, we would like to venture into it. So if they, in fact, all our current activities are part of that sustainability, whether it is reclaimed rubber, CDF, or whether it's engineering plastic, nylon recovery, or rubber composites, polymer compound, all these are in that same sphere. So we want to grow in all this in future. And uh, that's how we would like to uh, be known in future. Super, super, super. I wish you the best, you know, sir, that one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as a part of the, you know, my, the rubber industry leadership, one question I do ask all the um, guests is that, uh, please recommend a few best practices for the managers as well as the leaders of the rubber industry to excel and to sustain in the business for a long time. Can you share some? I know we have, we talked a lot, all those things, good practices, what you've done, but kind of summarizing it. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I'm qualified to uh, give a some kind of a lecture on the best practices because I'm not an academician from that angle. Uh, but uh, from my experience only, I can say that uh, one of the real quality required is to be authentic and to be trustworthy. If you, as a practice, be authentic, be trustworthy, it will help you in your family life, it will help you in your workplace life, it will help you in your community life. So, and that practice cannot be different in different places. You cannot be honest at home and dishonest at workplace, or you cannot be uh, authentic at home uh, or unauthentic at home and authentic at workplace. So those are the uh, first quality I would look at. Uh, the second I see is, uh, you know, the technologies are changing, times are changing. One has to learn to adapt. Uh, what was the practice? For example, look at it when I started my college, I'm going to finish my call. By the time I finished college, there was log books to slide rules. Yes. Uh, the calculators had come thereafter. Uh, when I graduated, I graduated with a slide rule in my hand and not a calculator. Then the calculators have come and now so many things. So the, the fax machines have gone, the, the all the different kinds of phones have gone and you know, you see the technology has changed. So one has to learn to adapt. So adaption means learning, unlearning, and relearning. And it's an ongoing process, I would say, for managers. So whether it is running the companies, managing, leading people, leading teams, and breaking into different products, this is the thing uh, we have to learn. Everybody will have to learn to adapt, to sort of uh, look at it. And third is, as I just mentioned, that uh, we are in the area of explosion of information. Information is available so easily, but there's so much of misinformation within that information. So each one needs to learn to discern what is right, what is useful, what is important, and, uh, and make a choice on the basis of how you discern the information. 
and uh, if you do that a lot of your time can be saved today we spend more time in on the whatsapp whatsapp in reading all this information then spending more time in forwarding it without understanding <laughs> so so if, if one can learn how to listen and to discern and then it will be helpful from that and uh, i think uh, other uh, is this uh, this whole question of uh, becoming bold and taking certain decision on the basis of values that you cherish uh, and uh, then seeing that you be proactively pursue it and you will have to have faith and always look at long term rather than short term uh, any relationship uh whether it is with a customer whether it is with your spouse whether it is with your friends it has to be on long term basis so you have to invest in the relationship before you uh, reap the benefit of the relationship so your investment should continuously be going in that so that will depend upon how you cherish the relationship that's important from that angle uh of course you know you mentioned about time management so i feel there should be a healthy balance between uh, you know personal life family life and work life going forward uh, we each one has to be mindful of that right balance finally if i say one has to remain fit physically emotionally uh, and because you know tough times so when the going gets tough tough gets going as they say so yes. you remain you remain fit all the time very useful points and everybody should follow immediately you know uh, that is how it is and uh, hit the point very nicely thank you very much sir i uh, really enjoyed this conversation i wish i can continue this conversation more longer i think we are uh, we are at almost two plus hours now um, any final remarks to the audience no i would say just be happy and spread happiness be positive and create positive impact <laughs> super sir thank you very much thank you very thank you. much appreciate the time appreciate the you know the time and valuable input uh, i'm sure this all the audience they do find this uh, session very useful um, they learn a lot i personally today i i have taken so many notes of it what you are saying and uh, um, i'm really enjoyed this conversation and thank you very much for the time sir once again appreciate the time thank you thank you prasad for this thing and i uh, hope that we meet Uh, face to face in near future all the best thank to you sir. thank you sir guys uh, that's the end of this uh, session i'm with uh, mr rajendra gandhi under the rubber industry leadership program i'm hoping that um, if this session is valuable to you i will learn a lot i find it very useful i believe you do too uh, thanks again for being part of this uh, rubber industry leadership program Thank you very much.